You're listening to TFM. Want to join in the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode? Join the Babel Conference, our listeners' discussion group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the Facebook search field, and we look forward to seeing you there. This is Steve Sansweet of Rancho Obi-Wan, and you're listening to the 602 Club. Welcome to TFM's local watering hole. I am just one of the hosts here, Matthew Rushing, and I am so excited to have back as she has swung back into the 602 Club, Christy Morris. Hello. Yes, uh, swinging back is very apropos as we're back to our next Spider-Man film. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad to see everything's okay with the web shooters. You know, they haven't, you know, uh, shorted out on you, which is great. Yeah, I, I redesigned them so they can handle the electricity better. Oh, oh, man. Goodness. Well, thank you, Gwen Stacy. So, uh, well, we're back. We're so excited. As Christy mentioned, we're going to be talking about the amazing Spider Man 2. And before we get there, uh, of course, you know, find us wherever you get your podcasts. You know, if you're listening to us, make sure you're subscribed wherever that is. Uh, if you happen to be on Apple Podcasts, you know, we'd appreciate a star rating review. Help people find the show. Help the show continue to grow. Uh, and you can do that with that star rating and review. So uh, we'd really appreciate that. It's still one of the main places where people find podcasts. And so, uh, of course... Uh, you can find us on Twitter at the 602 Club, so follow us there. And you, we're also on Instagram, and you can follow us there at the 602 Club TFM. Uh, you can also find us uh, on Facebook at facebook.com slash trekfm with the entire network. We've got the listeners only discussion group you can join called the Babel Conference there on Facebook. And, of course, you can go over to trek.fm online, and you can go to the contact section and send Christy and I an email. And then we'd really like to say, of course, a huge thank you through our associate producers, Ken Tripp, Davis Grayson, Ryan Millett, and Daniel Noah. Do appreciate so much them supporting the show through Patreon and make sure that this show, as well as the network, keeps coming to you. And it really, truly is, especially through the COVID year, we've kind of suffered with that. So if you want to make sure that everything here in the network keeps coming to you and that we can continue to move forward, uh, go to patreon.com slash trekfm and be part of our team. Uh, so. Christy, um, I'm I'm interested with this one. Uh, is um, is it one that I mean? Did you go to the theater to see this movie? I definitely did, and I vividly remember just being in awe the first time I saw it because there were so many interesting things happening. Did you? I did. Yeah. Uh, at this point, obviously, it was it was definitely you know prime movie going. You know, comic book movies had really started to hit their stride, and so um, I you know. It was it was one I was not going to miss, especially since, you know, and I know like you, I had liked the first one. And so mm -hmm. I was very interested. They, I, you know, we talked about last time I was very skeptical of them bringing back Spider-Man again so quickly uh, in a reboot. But the first one had my interest uh, and, uh, you know, I definitely wanted to continue that. And so what well, and. What was interesting to me then is that this one, like the first one, starts off by giving us more backstory for what happened to Richard Parker and his wife and exactly why it is that they left. And of course, that story also gets weaved into kind of the rest of the movie as Peter works to figure that out because he's still kind of struggling with, you know, the fact that his his mother and father had left him. And so... I, I thought that this was uh, a really fascinating way to take the story because I felt like, as especially with what we get here with those revelations, it, it truly does set itself apart from the other movies that had come and make this quite unique in the Spider-Man universe. I agree. I, I think that Obviously, before it, there was such a focus on Uncle Ben and his death then causing Peter to make the decisions he does, but it being a lot more of a dark tone, whereas this gives Peter more of a reason to take a positive interest in 
where his parents are coming from and what happened to them um, and has more for him to discover about them than just, you know, something incredibly sad. You know, he's finding out more about himself. Um, he's also finding new things that, uh, of course, you know, I, I thought it was really cool. We kind of have this national treasure element to it of he has to go find the Roosevelt car and, um, you know, put in the coins that were inside the calculator. I, I thought some things like that were really cute to add to make it more of a mystery and a um, journey for him rather than just a, yeah, they're gone. Get over it. Yeah, I, I I like what you said there, like this idea of like, and it's funny, we're going to cover those films, uh, you know, later on, uh, the, the National Trevor films this year, which I think is going to be really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'm excited to to be able to to do that. But you're absolutely right. That That's exactly what I thought of as well, is that it kind of comes down to that whole idea of like uncovering this this mystery that does feel like that, where that you have this hidden thing that is connected to something historical um, which is this train station, uh, this subway station that had been abandoned, uh, and they had created specifically for, you know, Roosevelt, uh, to use when he's in New York, so, uh, and to kind of hide the fact that he had polio. Um, and so that his dad had used this as a research station, um, that could, he could hide away from the rest of the world, the research that he was doing. And the big reason that he does that which I thought was really interesting, um, was the fact that his dad found out that Norman Osborn wanted to to take his research and create biogenetic weapons. Mm-hmm. And that is the main reason that he and... Peter's mom, Mary, go into hiding in the first place, that they they escape because they don't want their son to be part of this life that they're going to have, which is to run and to always be looking over their shoulder. And mm-hmm. I I don't, I so I've never read Spider-Man comics, so I was wondering, I know you have more familiarity with the comics uh, for Marvel. Is that, is any of this something that comes from any of the comics, whether it be the Spider-Man comics or the ultimate Spider-Man universe. So that specifically, I don't remember. All I remember is that the parents still died in a plane crash. Um, But that I know that it wasn't the Roosevelt thing. (laughs) Um, But it's, it's definitely, I think more interesting, like I said, than going with just the, the uncle Ben dying story. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I mean, you know, they say too, when they were developing the movie that they're inspired by the comics, but not everything is going to be sure exactly the same, but I like that, you know, that they're adding something a little bit stretching of the truth. Yeah. I, this is a big one though, too, because they do add something pretty specific here to the creation of Spider-Man which is that the research that his father was doing is tied specifically to his DNA. Like he encodes his own DNA into the spider so that nobody can misuse this research unless they have that DNA. So therefore, the only person that could become Spider-Man in the first place would either have been Richard or Peter, or I guess possibly... I guess not even his mom would because, you know, she doesn't share that DNA. Well, let's and hope so, not. <laughs> um, so I think, no, I, sorry. Th- you know, that's just really fascinating to me. Uh, so how did mm-hmm. that sit with you, especially since, you know, you're much more steeped in the comics? I really like that. You know, I think that it's it's kind of a tragedy in a, an interesting way that, they all want something good initially from this work. And that is to cure disease. You know, um, Harry Osborne wants it to cure him of this genetic disease that they have in his family. So it is interesting that they then loop that into things, you know, genes and disease. Um, but mm-hmm. there's always going the to be someone. Family. Yeah. 
But there's always going to be someone that wants to take something like this that's a tool for good and use it for something bad, Mm -hmm. like creating genetic or biologic weapons. Sure. It's yeah. the, you know, like Frankenstein kind of theory. Yeah. I, I You know, not being somebody who has, has read the comics, it was an interesting way to try and create something different and new, I thought. And I didn't have a problem with it. I, I thought it was interesting. Um, and like you said, it does try to tie into like you the idea of like family and the idea of genetics and what we pass on and all those kind of things, uh, which is interesting. Although I don't think even really that that film that the film really deals with any of those themes very well, mm-hmm. because there's there's a lot else going on in this movie. And we never really get to develop that in any way, shape, or form, which is kind of disappointing because I think um, that is a very good theme for this series. And specifically, I think Spider-Man to try to deal with, which is the idea of legacy and family as, you know, because it's played with that before, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, definitely part of the comics has always been that it's about these families that have interwoven stories, you know, um, that Peter and Harry were friends and that then, you know, there's these issues with Peter and his father and Peter and his uncle and aunt. And, you know, it's it's definitely going back to those things that are in the comics, Um, but then adding these other things to it. But I think, like you said, too, it's the problem then with this movie is just that there's so many things they're trying to do all in one package. Mm -hmm. So like individually they are good things, but then all together it's just doing too much. (laughs) Yeah, I, I I, absolutely. And I definitely think that's, you know, going to be something that we'll talk a lot more about as, as we get further into the movie. So, you know, this film specifically kind of starts out with uh, the idea when we get to Peter uh, and his, you know, he's he's being Spider-Man and um, we see him very early in the movie as him and Gwen are graduating that he is struggling very much with the promise that he had made Captain Stacy in his relationship with Gwen. And how do you feel like they kind of deal with this? as as a element of the film and and him kind of you know he he breaks up with her i think that their relationship is the best part of the movie because it's something that is so a well acted and then just be a, a really difficult thing that you could understand that he's got this responsibility that he can't get rid of and that puts everyone that's close to him in danger. Mm -hmm. But that he also has that human element of you love who you love and Mm -hmm. you can't just turn that off. So he's constantly caught in this back and forth, but you also feel for Gwen because you're like, gosh, stop playing with my heart, man. (laughs) Right. Pick one. Quit playing games with my heart. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, this was something that I was I was really fascinated to be able to talk with you about because one of the things that I thought was really interesting is how I did feel like that the point that Gwen makes to Peter about the fact that this is not her her father's choice. It's her choice. And she has all the facts, right? She's she's not being lied to. Mm-hmm. Peter has told her the truth. She knows who he is. She knows the risks, uh, especially since, you know, she's grown up with a dad who is a police officer. And I, I wondered, uh, it seemed a little bit, I, I mean, I know it's a classic trope of of superhero films, but I almost felt like that they they could have upended it, and I thought it might have been really 
a lot stronger if, to me personally, if this story had been more about Peter accepting the fact that this is about Gwen's choice and not his choice. And mm-hmm. not even her father's choice. She's an adult. She gets to make the choices that she wants, right? Like, she's a grown woman at this point. She's graduated high school. She's about to go to college. Uh, and she gets to make that decision on what she wants her life to be. And I I do kind of wish that the movie had allowed her, allowed that to be more the thematic element here than I think the trope of 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 the superhero saying no to the relationship because they're worried about that person dying. And and I think again she has a great point. It's like, so you're going to push me away so that I'll live, but we don't get to be together. So like you know, like there's this weird dynamic. So I don't know what what do you think of that? I do definitely get that, like it, that she was saying, you know, what kind of life is that? That, you know, if we're depriving ourselves of the one person that we want to be with, mm-hmm. then it's almost like you're dying, even though your body's right. still alive. Um, But I, I don't know, I, I struggle with it because I do, I guess the romantic in me always wants them to be together no matter what. Mm-hmm. Um. But I, I, I can see what you're saying as well of right. Gwen constantly having to say, like in the scene where she says, no, I break up with you. You don't get to keep calling his shots and telling me we're, we don't get to be together or sure. whatever, and I just have right. to go with it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that they they did need to give Gwen a little bit more of her own credit and agency in this story. Because I think we're definitely past the point where all of the women have to be the damsel in distress. Sure. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I'm not arguing that I don't want them to be together. And I think yeah. in many ways it would have been something that would have been really strong to have, you know, the fact that, you know, when she then dies in the film, that. this puts the onus as much on her as it does Peter, right? Mm -hmm. So that, because again, this is her decision. And she even says that at the end when she comes to help him, hey, I'm making this choice. This isn't about you. This is about me doing what I think is the right thing to do here. Mm -hmm. And part of that is what shows, I think, her bravery And her heroism is that she's not a superhero, but like her dad, she was willing to do whatever it takes to save her city, to save her friends. Um, And I think, you know, again, in some ways, by making it Peter's decision whether or not they're together does take just a little bit away from that storyline being even stronger by them just choosing to have that conversation and then Peter being like, you know what? You're right. This is your choice. And if you choose to be with me, um, then I will be with you, you know, Mm -hmm. that they're more equals in that. Um, and I, I think, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. They could have handled that a little better in the dialogue. Um, I, I still do think that the, the death scene um Mm -hmm. and like i said to my favorite scene ever in a spider-man movie which is peter looking at her from across the street and walking over um Mm -hmm. it it does still have a huge impact right um like i am no joke i've bawled my eyes out when she died again (laughs) Mm -hmm. um I I I think we got to talk about the death scene. I think you're 100% yeah. right. I think that that scene is done very very well and you know I I think that even the way it is it is very strong for the sense that they both made their choices that have led them to this point. And mm-hmm. I do think that it is one of those things to which then 
makes it very strong when she chooses that he chooses to go on. Right. And, and it will be, it would have been really interesting to see how they would have then played, um, you know, the storyline that they had it planned with, with, uh, Mary Jane for him, especially through a third movie, uh, and all that. So I, I think, you know, honestly, that just would have been fascinating, but I think the death scene itself is, beautifully shot it's beautifully filmed it's just an incredibly emotional scene there that i I think you know garfield plays to perfection and so uh yeah i i mean it's it it's even though you know it's coming i think it's Mm -hmm. still a truly affecting scene definitely and I mean, I'm sure you are familiar enough with the comics to know, like, this is almost exactly the way that her death happens in the comics. Um, it actually, it, and I wanted to throw that in because I think it needs to be said, this is probably the biggest shock that ever happened in comic books. Um, well, at least until it, Superman died, but, or yeah, after but, Superman um, died, but yeah. But yeah, but Gwen Stacy was so well liked and till this point a character like that was always believed to endure and mm-hmm. oh they can't be killed off cuz they're a hero or a heroine. Um and so it, her death although I do agree was overall it kind of a, it came to a natural conclusion that that was the way it had to be. Um was absolutely a shock. And then still in this movie, I'm glad that they included it because people then who may not have read it get to see what that felt like for people reading it when it happened. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and the effect that it's supposed to have on Peter. And then the way that he can realize, at least in the film version of the story, that she was doing something noble that she didn't know it was going to lead to that. But she did know the risks, you know, like you were saying, and that she wanted to be with him no matter what the cost and that she was willing to give her life for that. I think the thing that I love about that scene is how, you know, they make her his equal again. And they've continued to do this from the first film, which is, you know, she reminds him of something that he should remember from school uh, scientifically on how to beat Electro. Uh, and I think that's really beautiful in that sense, because what I was kind of complaining about before kind of takes away some of her, her equality with him in some ways, because he's not letting her make her own choices. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, though, helps reinforce the fact that they really, truly are equals. And in fact, the movie does that as well when he says, you know, up on the bridge, hey, I'm going to be... I'm going to London with you, you know, when she says, Hey, I got the, you know, he's like, I'm following you, you know? And so I think that that's where the movie does kind of redeem that part of the story a little bit for me. Um, And, and I, I really appreciate that they do that in these films because, you know, again, I think it, it, it jives so well with what they had set up in the first movie, which is her dad's a hero, right? who just goes out every day and does his job and he has no superpowers mm-hmm. and she's willing to do the same thing um, with her boyfriend who is a superpowered human being. So I, I think that, that again, that, that part with her death scene, it worked really, really well. Yeah. Uh, and, and it just, it also really works because it plays into, if you're thinking of classic, romantic storylines in the sense of like romantic tragedy um, that a hero's work to try and fix a situation can end up being his own undoing. They Mm -hmm. actually say in the comic and then show in this scene in the movie that he ended up causing her death, not only because she was put in that situation, but also because when he tries to catch her with the web shooter, the force of her momentum and yep. the snapback snaps yep. her neck. 
Well, and I think that, you know, again, even in that death right there is there's this this reality to it, right? You know, that these forces that we talk about, you know, I mean, it's one of the reasons that in Zack Snyder's Justice League, the Flash cannot just grab somebody and move. Because if mm-hmm. he did that at the speeds he's going, they die because they're not superheroes. They don't have that power. And so, yeah. like, he has to in the slowed time he like moves them very gently you know (laughs) and everything so um which is great i mean it's you're really thinking about what these powers would do to somebody right Mm -hmm. that's not superhuman and and i think this is one of those places where they truly did think about what happens if with somebody's momentum if they're not able to be slowed down before they're stopped and it's just like a jerk. Yeah, you're absolutely just probably going to snap somebody's back and or neck and they're probably going to die. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I think the whole scene and, and the whole thing with her death, I think is, again, it's it's really it's really well done. And so regardless of what else you know, I think about the movie, I do think that that is probably a, a, the best part. You know, it, it's... Yeah. You know, they, they pull it from the comics, and I think they do that justice. So, mm-hmm. um, and, and, you know, I just want to add as well that th- that's my favorite thing that they highlight in this movie is the positives and negatives of their relationship. You know, I think that really if they had focused more on that and given that storyline a little bit more, that it would have been the driving force of the whole movie um because obviously like we both said the death scene was so impactful i just wish they had had done a little Mm -hmm. bit more with gwen yeah and i i agree with you and part of that is because so we have two villains and i thought we we should definitely talk about both of them specifically Mm -hmm. because you know max dylan uh, is this electrical engineer who works for Oscorp. He's going to end up becoming Electro. Uh, and and so, would he be the villain then that you would choose? Like, if you had to choose between the villains here, because I think we're both saying in this, we, we would rather just have one villain so that we can just yes. focus more on other parts of the story. So would he be the one that you would choose, or would you choose Harry Osborn? Harry Osborn. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, so so then let's we'll talk about him in a minute. Then, so with Max Dillon, um, what do you think of Jamie Foxx's Electro and and the way that they take this character and kind of what they do with him? So it's an interesting idea. I just wish that the execution had been better, um, it, because I like that they're going with this power um, that you know literally. <laughs> Haha. Um, he, you know, has the power of being one with electricity and being able to, you know, phase through power lines and things. Um, that aspect of it is really cool. And I, I thought the effect looked cool, but there was just something that felt like it was missing to me um, with him in the movie. I don't know if it was Jamie Foxx just not really holding up his piece of the deal, or if it was that there wasn't enough development of a story to give him motivation as a character, but it just felt kind of empty. You know what I mean? Like it was all Mm -hmm. flash and no depth. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. And part of that, I think, is that, you know, what happens with him is that he becomes this... They play him off is all kind of crazy, right? You know, he he's mm-hmm. somebody who's been so mistreated in his life. He's been so taken advantage of. He's kind of retreated in his own little fantasy world. And that is what kind of ha- causes him uh, to not only think of Spider-Man as his best friend when Spider-Man saves him, like, you know, Spider-Man would anybody, Mm -hmm. Uh, but also to then make the leap that Spider-Man is his enemy, right? Once he gets these powers, you know, there's this, there's uh, a a craziness that they give this character, which I don't necessarily feel like is earned is mainly because they, I feel like that they play it a little bit too much for laughs 
his kind of idiosyncrasies. In, mm-hmm. And I feel like these Spider-Man movies are a little bit more, had have been a little bit more, or had been <laughs> a little bit more serious. Yeah. And then this movie kind of makes a shift with him as a character to where it's a little bit less serious. And then we'll get to Paul Giamatti's Rhino, but later, later. <laughs> but th- I, I, I feel like it almost would have been better to not go that route and maybe just make him more of the, the loner type character that isn't necessarily crazy, but just has kind of retreated you know and and i think maybe that might have made it work better because the other thing too is that i i feel like look they really play up the fact that this is a man who just wants to be known he wants to be loved he wants to be acknowledged as being there right yeah and again that's a theme that you really could have played with well but because they treat him as this kind of like comedic character it doesn't the, the again that thematic element doesn't play off well in fact he could have been mm-hmm. a great foil for peter in that way for a, a peter who's struggling with should i be with gwen or should i just be alone and if i don't have gwen then who could i talk to you know and and kind of had mm-hmm. that mirroring going on but they it just again they never even seem to think about that really and it just doesn't really work. And then the way they kind of connect with him with Harry Osborn then is along those lines. But I, again, I just don't think it necessarily works there either. Yeah, I think that you hit on exactly where I was trying to go and wasn't quite getting across. Um, he, it seems like he jumps right into, well, now I hate Spider-Man. And it's it just feels like, it, there wasn't enough reason there for him to go from adoring him and obsessing over him to being like, I absolutely hate him and now I want to kill him and everything that he stands for, or whatever, you know, it, um, yeah, I think you just needed either for him to have some other driving desire to accomplish, or you needed to have him hate Spider-Man from the beginning for, having all of the fame and adoration that he wants. There you go. Um, I don't know. It just, there there was something missing there. And I, I think that it could have been really cool if he had just more reason to be doing what he was doing. Right. Well, and, uh, you know, what's interesting too is that I think the look and the feel of the character is really cool. You know, I think the, the the way they create him, the the especially even at that point, you know, the special effects that they're using to create him were pretty cool, and everything. Mm-hmm. You know, the way they're bringing him back. Also, remember in Watchmen, you know, when he comes back together finally, you know, and you you see all the um, molecules, know, molecules, or- and everything, and then they form the the the. Uh, skeletal structure and everything and like all that kind of works the the same way here and so it's it's it, it's great um i think it's disappointing that the character design can't match the character in the sense that there's just all, i in in all honesty just this lack of seriousness that they had given to say you know the lizard in the first movie that they just don't seem to give him in the movie. And and then on top of that, we don't just have one villain in this movie. We have two, which is, seems to be the thing we want to do with sequels is give you more than one villain. And it's Harry Osborn. And, you know, we we have done this before in a Spider-Man movie already. <laughs> and I... Look, I, 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 you said you would choose him as as the villain. So first, I'd love to hear why you would choose him over uh, Electro. Purely for storytelling purpose, I think that he already has a lot more character motivation, um, knowledge with the audience. Um, and I, I think that the actor 
um, I can't remember his name at the moment, but I, I also liked him in Valerian. Um, I think the actor does a, a good job with it, but I, you know, I also like that they're using the original character involved in Gwen Stacy's death in the comic, then involved in Gwen Stacy's death here in the movie. Um, so it, it jives well with all of that then being enveloped in this movie. Um, I do wish that he had been the only villain so that then they could flesh out his story with his dad better and his story with Peter leading up to that scene better. Mm -hmm. Um, But I still would have picked him over Electro. Yeah, it's really interesting because I 100% see what you're saying about the fact that he fits better kind of thematically Mm -hmm. as a character. And that... As as a character as well, you know, with his his own daddy issues, his own parental issues, uh, that makes sense. Um, you know, I think one of the main reasons you have him in this movie is that because he gives Peter a good place to be having conversations and give him the kind of the impetus to kind of like move forward and cr- truly figure out what happened to his own parents. Uh, and then that leads to, you know, the discoveries he makes, which is, I think, great. Uh, also, too, I think it helps with the fact that the way they do take the story for them breaking up Gwen and Peter, and that gives Peter a place to kind of put his emotional turmoil, you know, what he's dealing with and, 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 and mm-hmm. all of that, like a, a place to focus in the film instead of just kind of like not having a focus at all because right. you know Harry comes back to his life his dad dies and all that i i will say i don't love him in this role i i don't think dane dehan was great but that mm-hmm. could just be the script mm-hmm. uh, but i don't really think that's it uh, as much as i didn't love his performance oh okay I really didn't like his performance once him and Electro were together. Uh, and he just came off as like angry emo boy, which I <laughs> did not like at all. Um, and absolutely feel like you had to choose one villain or the other here. Yeah. And I think it works better if it's just Green Goblin. That's a much, in in Harry Osborne, that's a much better story because it works with the rest of the things that you're trying to do Mm -hmm. uh, over Electro. So I think you're right in that. But as as he's played here and who he's played by and the storyline for him... I'm, I'm, it's a toss up for me because both of them are frustrating. Um, and so... I meant to ask you too, by the way, um, the other difference I noticed in this Green Goblin versus the Tobey Maguire movies, Green Goblin, did you realize that in the previous movies, it was purely a suit to make him look like Green Goblin right, right. versus this was actually, yep. he's got the serum from the spiders and is mm-hmm. morphed some. And then he's also, there's some kind of healing power in the suit. Yes. Yeah, uh, no, I think, uh, you know, that part uh, was was better and more interesting and felt more comic book like. And of mm-hmm. course, it, it made sense with the, the serum uh, and, and this illness that he has that he's, you know, um, obtained from his father genetically. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I think all of that was interesting. Again, this movie has some interesting stuff. But yeah. There's just it, nothing has the time that it needs because they've just crammed too much of it in, which leads me to a section I like to call too many Easter eggs. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and one of them has to be the terrible, and I mean absolutely awful introduction of Paul Giamatti's Rhino that yep. it is... It's baffling to me, one, that Paul Giamatti would even do this. 
And two, that you would waste Paul Giamatti so horrendously in this in this way. I, I just I could not believe it. And it goes on for too long. I mean, it, they have him facing off against the kid, but apparently at that point he's got some kind of remorse, which I mean, thank goodness, because no one wants to see someone kill a kid. Um, but it's still, it, it goes on for too long. It's not matching in the tone with the rest of the movie. Right. And like you said, wasting a really good actor <laughs> in this bit part that was not necessary it was the third Mm -hmm. villain in a movie that already had too many villains and it might have been interesting if this character was the character that peter is chasing down in the beginning of the movie and then you don't see till the next movie and or there's just an end credit sequence to which harry goes to him And they choose to team up and then they create, they're working to create, they were working towards the Sinister Six. Yeah. And that would have been much stronger. But just the portrayal and the way they did this all, it just didn't work at at, at all. I mean, he, he worked enough in the beginning just to be the character that is trying to get away with this ridiculous heist. That was Mm -hmm. okay. Um, But still it was a little over the top and too much even there. So That was just really frustrating because you're absolutely right. A third villain and a major villain at that, at the very end of the movie showing up in his, you know, quote unquote costume and everything. It just, uh, I don't know what they were thinking. They, well, I mean, basically they jumped the shark. Really, they were. They jumped the rhino. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Nice. Um they were doing so well with, like you said, like the build up to possibly having Rhino in the next movie. Um, you know, with just having Harry now in an asylum and having a friend come and talk to him and they're kind of alluding to, and then they show that brief scene of the suit. Um, I think that would have been just enough. Mm-hmm. You've piqued my interest. Now move on. Yeah. And show me in the next movie. They didn't need to have any more of him in that. But then they said, ah, let's give them what they want now. And you're like, mm-hmm. and the whole thing went flat. <laughs> well, and, and what's really interesting, too, is they kind of do the same thing with Felicity Jones's Felicia Hardy, a.k.a. Black Cat. And that mm-hmm. the same thing that Marvel did in Iron Man 2 with Scarlett Johansson's character, right? Which... Mm-hmm. They are trying to introduce her as somebody who's going to be important later on and yet do it, I guess, in a subtle, more subtle way. And yet here, it just it's like she doesn't mean anything to anyone because they yeah. never even give you a hint other than saying her name is Felicia. And you would have to be a comic person to know that that meant anything. And Mm -hmm. again, it's just one more Easter egg that they're kind of putting in there, but that never, there's never any kind of payoff whatsoever in this film, Uh, you know, and I think it's disappointing because, I mean, gosh, you just completely wasted Felicity Jones, too. I mean, Felicity Jones is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, they could have even with her had some kind of other teaser where they show you like she's got a suit in her bag and she's, you know stuffing it away or something, you know, like something like that to pique your interest and show you there's more to her than meets the eye, but they never do that. And they keep trying to bring her in and make you think she's important, but you don't get why she would be because they don't give you a reason to care. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Well, and this is fascinating too, because they had shot scenes with Shalane Woodley as Mary Jane and her and Peter were supposed to have a couple of scenes together, just what they were talking like over the fence and stuff, you know, and not, mm-hmm. not anything um, big or anything where they're, you know, you see them as like having any kind of relationship, obviously. Uh, but they decided not to do that because they wanted to streamline the story and focus on Peter and Gwen. And I'm thinking to myself, if you wanted that, you needed to cut one of these villains so you could give more time to that because that. I mean, yes, that would have been way too much for this film, 100%. So I'm yeah. glad they did cut it. But 
they didn't cut enough. <laughs> right? Like, you're like, oh, you wanted to streamline the storyline. Now you want to streamline. <laughs> exactly. You needed to cut two villains and, uh, you know, some some of the footage off the end and all kinds of things. So, uh, yeah, there was just a lot of stuff thematically that they're trying to cram in here that they could have spread out into the next right. movie and yeah. then possibly gotten a good movie. So I wanted to ask you, too, you know, obviously the action is ramped up in this movie. And uh, I think they're definitely trying to create some really cool action sequences, even from the very beginning. I mean, they're, again, trying to put you in the pilot seat, basically, with Peter as he is swinging, trying to give you a real sense of what that's like. This movie was was um, put into 3D in, in theaters, you know, so that... People could really experience that. I actually have the 3D Blu-ray, even though I don't have a 3D player uh, anymore mm. that could actually do that. And I never had the glasses either. So, um, so I mean, what did you think of the action of the film and, and how that worked? I think they leaned into it a little bit too much. Um, you know, it, in the last film, they introduced it enough to where it was cool to see it was a little bit different um and it felt more realistic as to how it would feel if you were spider-man but here it feels like they drank their own kool-aid and they're just constantly trying to throw that in your face um so i wish they had backed off of that a little bit um and in some of the action it it felt like they were again like leaning into it too much and it was more comical than it was um stakes that you're really concerned about um although i did think it was really funny that they play the itsy bitsy spider when he's ping-ponging between the things in the power plant <laughs> sorry i do yeah <laughs> uh, i mean i i think some of it was good and some of it wasn't you know, yeah. I, I think there's some there is some cool stuff here. Um, I, I think there's some really there are some over the top things with the action, but the death and, scene, yeah, spot that, on. That was fantastic. Um, and I liked the f I did like the first sequence of him facing off with L Electro in Times Square. I thought that was pretty good. Mm hmm. But even that final sequence where they were fighting, I didn't love. It was okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, yeah. So, and I think part of that is because, you know, this score this time is done by Hans Zimmer. And they really leaned into a very strange thing, which was to have lyrics in some of the sequences where it's like Electro talking to himself. Oh, yes, like voices in his head mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. And I, whereas I liked the other parts of the score, I, Hans Zimmer, I think, did a pretty good job with that and, and carried on for what James Horner had done. I didn't like that choice, honestly. I just didn't. Yeah, yeah. At, at first, I thought, oh, that's different. Hmm. But it does it get more distracting than enjoyable or something you want to go back and listen to again. Yeah, it, I, I'm with you on that. I think that one I, I, item makes it confusing and distracting rather than enjoyable. Yeah, absolutely. Because otherwise, you know, I thought Zimmer did a really good job I, and i when listening to the score a little bit and, and was enjoying what what he had created and he'd worked with some people to uh to, to kind of help him with this and in, in some of those i think electronic scenes and mm -hmm. uh yeah this one just uh, th those on a whole just didn't work for me as well as they could have um i just think it was more distracting than anything else you know i i think mm -hmm. You know, we already have a sense that this guy is already in his head a lot. I don't know if we, I don't know if we needed through the score to accentuate that. You could have done that, I think, again, musically in a way that didn't need kind of like weird lyrics. So, 
Yeah. Or, just didn't or the lyrics that are like so soft, you're constantly straining to hear. That's what it is that's so distracting about it. I kept trying to figure out what the voices are saying. Mm. Yeah, I know. That's a great <laughs> point. That's a great point. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, all in all, I guess I, for me, I am quite interested then to see where you do come down ratings wise with Amazing Spider Man 2. So, I like I said, I have to admit, I'm a, I'm a little bit biased in the sense of I do love that they included, even though it's terribly tragic, um, the death of Gwen Stacy and that they honored a lot of what was already in the comics for that. Um, and I like how they show that she is absolutely a part of Peter and, you know, that scene, like I said, where he's seeing her from across the street and slowly walking over. It's like time stops for him when he's looking at Gwen. And I love that. And um, she has a lot of weight to her character and a lot of her dad in her. Um, so those are the things that I think really forgive a lot for me with this movie. Um, and Emma Stone and Andrew Garfield totally carry it. Um, but I think that there are, like we said, too many villains, too many story elements that they're trying to cram together. Um, and I wish that Goblin had been a little better and, and more hashed out. Um, so it, ultimately I give it a three out of five. Um, because I, there are a lot of things I really love about it. So I see past some of those big criticisms that I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think though that, you know, you're, doing a great job and and being very honest with with how you feel about the film and and why you there are things to which ameliorate for you the issues some of the issues mm -hmm. right and i think i think that's quite all right you know there's nothing wrong with having some things in a movie that um work for you better than they work for others and and allow you to enjoy the film in a way that maybe other people don't you know um, mm -hmm. It's fascinating to me because this is a, a, a sequel to which Robert uh, Orsi and Roberto Orsi and Alex Kurtzman kind of come into and kind of really don't do a good job on. Uh, they did that with The Legend of Zorro. They did that with Transformers uh, Revenge of the Fallen, uh, with uh, Star Trek in Darkness. I mean, this is a movie they came in and... and uh, they co-wrote it's not great uh, they just mm. cram way too much stuff in here and and that's a disappointment and i will say that the the stuff we did get with with peter and with gwen i'll give this 3 out of 5 stars yes i i probably should give it more like 2 and a half out of 5 but i don't hate this film but I just think uh, it, it's an exercise and frustration for me because there is so much of this that I see that could have been tweaked to have been done better. It, it, it reminds me a little bit with how I feel and how I felt about when we talked about Batman Forever. It's like mm -hmm. I see the way to make this better and it's not super difficult. And, and that is frustrating although I, I you know i've seen way worse comic book movies too so i i just can't get that up in arms about this film you know so um yeah and then so we i don't guess, get more andrew garfield so well and that's, that's frustrating. And, and what's most frustrating about the movie is that they killed the franchise yeah you know they killed this reboot uh and never got the opportunity to do any more. And it's, it, I, I always wanted the end of this story. I always yeah. wanted to at least see the end of the story. And it's this point, they never got a chance to do that. Um, and I, I think this was also a place where, you know, they just started to put the cart before the horse where they were really trying to set up an entire Spider-Man universe with all this stuff instead of just trying to make the best film they could each time. And yep. this is one of the places where uh, uh, sequelitis 
and, and the need for to continually create sequels creates an, an issue. And so, yeah, that's disappointing. So, but I am interested to see what you are going to recommend to everybody this week. Oh, I'm so excited. And, uh, I, you know, I may have already given it away to some people, but, um, I was recently looking through work by an actor that my husband and I really love, Robert Sheehan, who plays Klaus on Umbrella Academy, if people are not familiar with him. And if you look through his other work, he was also in a show that was on from 2009 to 2013, which I can't believe I never saw because I'm also into stuff on BBC and this was a BBC show, Um, but it's called Misfits. And it was a TV show on BBC, um, and it was about a group of young offenders sentenced to work in a community service program where they obtained supernatural powers after a strange electrical storm. Um, and like I said, Robert Sheehan is in it. He's incredible Irish actor. Um, there's a couple other people that are not super well known, but uh, you may be familiar with the guy that played Ramsey Bolton. In Game of Thrones. Yes. He's in this. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I recommend checking out Misfits. Uh, I'm on season one and I love it. And it's streaming for free on Hulu right now. So Nice. That's awesome. Well, I am going to recommend uh, something to everyone. Uh, I just had a friend over and he had he'd never seen The Matrix. And so I finally got a chance to uh, pull out my... Matrix 4K edition, and oh my gosh, that that movie looks so good in 4K. It's Ooh. so crisp and so clean. It looks in many ways like it was made today. And The Matrix is already a fantastic movie in the first place, but oh my goodness, in 4K HDR, it is phenomenal. So I'm going to recommend go out and find The Matrix in 4K because it's phenomenal. And, I mean, it's it's one of those movies, uh, honestly, you know, if you wanted a side-by-side comparison of why you should get a 4K television if you don't have one and a 4K player so that you could play 4K movies, whoo, this is definitely one of them. I was stunned by how good it looks. So, and plus it's just fun to revisit The Matrix because, well, it's it's almost, it's pretty much a perfect movie, so... Uh, Mm -hmm. anyway, but, uh, Christy, if, uh, people of course want to catch up with you and see what else you've got going on, where can they find you? You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Bespin Bell. And, uh, of course, sometimes in the Babel conference, I'll poke my head in and talk about things. And then if you're looking for me, uh, aside from 602 Club, I do a show with my friends Amanda and Teresa called Sabres and Spells. And we talk about all the geeky niche stuff that we don't usually get to talk about. So I hope that you'll check that out as well on all your social media platforms at Sabres and Spells. And, of course, uh, you can find me here on the network, uh, not only here on the 602 Club, but also check out in the same feed Snyder Cuts that I did with John Mills as we talked about all of Zack Snyder's films. And, of course, doing literary treks in the Orb, literary treks about the books and the comics of Star Trek and the Orbs about Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Over on the Nerd Party Network, doing two shows. A uh, One, uh, I finished up, did that with Drea Kaufman. And we talked about every single chapter of the Harry Potter series one chapter at a time in Owl Post. So you can check that out. And I'm doing Aggressive Negotiations with John Mills. And it's a Star Wars podcast. And each and every week uh, you can hear us talk about something fun in the Star Wars universe. So thank you, though, so much for joining us. And y'all come back now, you hear? <laughs>